Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen. Today we're going to uh, do a little side dish. I've got the fire going outside and I'm doing a beef tenderloin over the coals. And I wanted to make a potato dish to go with it. So I've got a frying pan here that I'm actually gonna cook the dish in completely. And I'm going to put on a little bit of bacon that I've chopped up and I just wanna fry that out gently to start releasing the bacon fat, to render out the baking fat. Last night, um, while I was cooking dinner, I threw some baking potatoes into the oven because it was on, it was hot. And I cooked these last night, left them in the fridge overnight so that they would cool down and harden up a little bit. And I just want to start shredding them, I've already started, shredding them into this bowl. And I'm grating it in with the skin and all. If you want to skin your potato, go right ahead. If you don't want to skin your potato, you don't have to. It just doesn't matter. Really, do, uh, do it the way you want to do it. So this is a recipe that isn't really a recipe, it's a method. Um, it really is a method. Beyond the fact that you're going to use potatoes and cheese, uh, everything else is up to your taste. And it's kind of a take on what some people might call a funeral potato. It's kind of a take on what some people might call a steakhouse potato. It is, uh, in a lot of ways, a deconstructed, twice-baked potato. We've done this recipe on the channel not too long ago, and I made something similar to this using dry potato flakes. Essentially what you're doing by baking the potato is you're cooking it all the way through and you're drying it out a little bit so that you can grate it. But the key is that you're drying it out a little bit. So I've got this pretty much grated down to the end. Um, some of the skin is maybe a little bit big. I'll just grab that with my fingers and pull it apart to make it smaller. Now the bacon is starting to look pretty good. You could take this um, full crispy if you want to. I'd like to leave it just a little bit chewy. So I'm gonna leave it there. And to that, I'm going to add a couple of chopped up onions and fry those off until they're soft. I don't want the onions to brown. I just wanna sort of soften and caramelize them. Now back to the potatoes. This is the kind of thing that depending on how you spice it or which herbs you put into it um, or which kind of cheese you use, you could move this from a dinner side dish to sort of a breakfast side dish. If you were having like a holiday breakfast buffet and you wanted to put a potato casserole out for people to have, just change the cheese a little bit, change the spicing a little bit and it does double duty. I'm gonna keep it really simple today. Because I'm doing um, something out on the fire pit, there's gonna be lots of flavor in the meat. I want a nice, relaxed side dish to go with this. So I'm just gonna stir this up to sort of mix through the pepper and the salt a little bit. And then I'm gonna grate in some cheddar cheese, and this is old cheddar. You can use the same grater that you use the potatoes. Now I'm using an old cheddar or an aged cheddar because I really like the flavor of that. You could use a mild cheddar. If you like Colby, Monterey, Jack, those would be fantastic. Wisconsin Brick, again, another great cheese to use in this because it's melty. Um, you really are looking for an easily melted cheese, something that becomes gooey and really, really great tasting. But you could use any cheese that you like. It's up to your flavor. Um, you decide what you wanna put in here. If you wanna go to a blue cheese, that would work um, absolutely amazing or fantastic. And I know that my giving endless variations to a lot of the recipes that I do drive some people nuts. That's okay. If you don't want variation, there is a recipe written in the description box below the video. You can follow that to a T and, and make that. But I really do encourage people to learn a method. Um, take it as a method, not as a recipe. If it's descriptive rather than prescriptive, you can make it your own and you can really tailor, tailor it to your own taste buds and you can come up with something that's unique to your family, um, which I think is always really exciting. So I'm gonna mix the cheese in and I think I've got enough. I think I've got enough cheese in here to make it really great. So let's turn our attention back to the onions and the bacon and I think those are looking fantastic. A Little bit of caramelization on the onion, looking good. Okay, so just plop those into the bowl with everything else. And give it a stir, mix it all together. 
in a lot of ways, it's like a pierogi filling without the wrapper, and I love pierogies. So there's two more ingredients that I'm going to put in. One is garlic, and so this is garlic. Uh, we grow a lot of garlic in our garden, and it's very early in the season. It's the end of May, and so the garlic has just sprouted up, and at the bottom it hasn't grown into cloves or that bulb yet. It hasn't grown the scape out of the top yet, so the bulb at the bottom hasn't grown at all. And so it's got a shape like a green onion, and it's got a really mild, mild garlic flavor that I love. So we use it in the springtime just like this. Um, we grow enough garlic that if I pull probably 75 or 80 stalks like this to use in other dishes, it's fine. We don't lose any at the end of the season. So I just take off the outermost one. Usually it's purple. And so I just pull off the outermost skin and then chop it up. You can use the whites and the greens, doesn't really matter. Um, they both have a slightly different flavor, just like a white or green part of a green onion. And if you don't have garlic growing in your garden, that's fine. You can just use regular old garlic. Garlic powder works great too. You do get more of a punch from garlic powder, so I'm gonna put in, I, I don't like that one, let's get rid of that. I'm gonna put in about this much. I think that's what I'm gonna put in. So, dump that into the bowl. And I may hang on to the tops and shred those up and sprinkle them on top just before service. The last thing I'm gonna put in is some sour cream. And you've probably heard me say this before, try to get the best sour cream that you can get. Um, sour cream should only really have two, maybe three ingredients. One of them should be cream, one of them should be bacteria. Like the ingredients on this one are milk, cream, skim milk powder, and bacteria. So it's all milk and bacteria. But I know that sour cream like this is difficult to get in some places. A lot of sour cream has other additives in it to make it seem thicker and to extend it so that they can sell it at a cheaper price. So buy the one that you can afford. I mean, that's the most important thing. Don't buy stuff that you can't afford. But I find that ones that are just cream and bacteria don't separate, they cook better. Um, you get a better end product. And maybe that's just me. You know, in the end, do what you gotta do to put food on the table for your family. I think that's the most important part, that you can feed everyone. So, I'm gonna put in a little bit more sour cream. Again, not a recipe, I'm just doing a method. I've made this enough over and over and over again that it just becomes second nature and you don't really think about it too much. Now, once I've got this all mixed together, I'm just gonna tip it back into that frying pan, cast iron frying pan that I cooked the bacon in. And we're gonna tamp it down into the frying pan. And that's pretty much it. Now you can come around and make some nice patterns on the top if you want, sort of give it some layers. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick this in the fridge because it's early afternoon. I'm nowhere near supper time. About 45 minutes, half an hour before I'm ready to serve this, I'll take it out of the fridge, I'll put it into the oven, preheated at 425. Cook it for about a half an hour. At the end of that half hour cook, I'll move it up to the broiler and I'll just brown off the top just before I bring it to the table. Whew. Hey, Glenn, is this what you were looking for? I assume. That's, that's it. That's the one. Looks pretty good. Look at that. Is that a tea towel? Yeah. Don't look at that. Don't look at that just yet. <laughs> we're going to taste the potatoes first. It so. Looks a bit like a hash brown. Um, <sighs> steakhouse potatoes. It's a riff on maybe funeral potatoes, depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. um, it's a deconstructed twice baked potato. Ooh. Ooh, and I see you've got bacon in it and too. And there's bacon. <laughs> You're gonna have to get the bacon in. Good bacon. for you. So, uh, mm-hmm. Should have served this in a bowl, but you know, we're outside. We need to dig right in. That's got all those great flavors of a of, of a baked potato, and it's got that and it's got, that it's got a top. super fun crunchiness that to crunchy it. Crunchy top on the edge. That's amazing. We can fight over the edge later. No and one's gonna want this part. <laughs> and the bottom. The bottom has got a really nice crust Yeah, so maybe it'll be country all the way around. All the way Excellent. around. Excellent. So okay. that's a winner, my friend. That is a winner. Now, I don't know. You could put almost anything in it. I think jalapenos would work really well in it. 
after I got it together, I thought to myself, you know what, I should have put in horseradish. Ooh, depending upon what you're eating with. Grated horseradish yes. would go really well in it. There are, I mean, it's like anything. If it's baked potatoes, you mm -hmm. know, they always bring out all sorts of things to put with it. You have to decide what you like. Chives on top, maybe a little bit more sour cream on top when you go to serve it. All kinds of things. That's great. That's going to go really well with this roast. With the Tito? But you're going to have to come back <laughs> to see how we cook this later. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.